I think that when I'm high, I'm over you. Welcome. Today's video is about propositional logic. What is common to all logics is that we separate between syntax and semantics. Syntax determines how the formulas in the logic look like. Semantics determines what the formulas mean. To explain the syntax of propositional logic, I will first show you the symbols that we need for propositional logic. First of all, we have the symbol for conjunction, pronounced and. It looks like a little hat, and you can produce it in LaTeX by writing backslash wedge. LaTeX is the software that you want to use to produce nice looking solutions to your homework exercises and that I used to write the course notes, of course. Then there's a symbol called negation, pronounced not, which you get in LaTeX by writing backslash neg. And a symbol true, which you get in LaTeX by writing backslash top. We also use the opening bracket and the closing bracket, which you can just type with your keyboard. And we need variable symbols, arbitrarily many variable symbols. So I can't write them all, but typically I will use capital X, Y, Z, or when I run out of letters or whenever it is convenient, I put subscripts, X1, X2, and so on. We need to define what a propositional formula is. Such formulas will be strings, that is, finite sequences of symbols. Not all sequences of symbols are formulas, they have to be well formed. What it means to be well formed is defined inductively. First of all, true and every variable is a propositional formula. This is the induction basis. Now suppose that phi is a propositional formula. Then not phi is also a propositional formula. So phi is just a sequence of symbols and not phi is the string that we get by prepending the negation symbol. Finally, if phi1 is a propositional formula and phi2 is a propositional formula, then opening bracket phi1 and phi2, closing bracket, is a propositional formula. The set of propositional formulas is precisely the set of strings that you can build like this. Formally, it is the smallest set of strings that satisfies one, two, three, four above. I will present an example of a propositional formula with variables x, y, and z. The purpose of the brackets is to keep track of how the formula was built inductively. So the outermost pair of brackets is not really important in this respect, and so it is often omitted. Note that if we keep track of how the formula was built inductively, then this gives rise to a tree-like structure called the syntax tree, or sometimes also called the parse tree. It is not hard to see that every propositional formula has a unique syntax tree. So far, I simply defined certain strings. I did not yet explain what these strings mean. Suppose that phi is a propositional formula with the variables x1, x2, and so on until xn. And let s be a function that maps each variable either to the value 0 or to 1. Here, 0 stands for false and 1 stands for true. The set 0, 1 is sometimes also called the Boolean domain and s is called a Boolean assignment. We now define what it means that s satisfies phi. This is again done inductively. s satisfies xi if s applied to xi equals 1. s always satisfies true. Now, s satisfies not psi if s does not satisfy psi. Psi is a shorter propositional formula than not psi, and we assume inductively that we already know whether S satisfies Psi. Finally, S satisfies Phi1 and Phi2 
if s satisfies phi 1 and s satisfies phi 2. So what, what is the semantics of a propositional formula? Propositional formulas can be used to describe so-called Boolean operations. Suppose that x1 up to xn are variables, and that phi is a propositional formula with variables x1 up to xn. A Boolean operation of n is a function from the nth power of the Boolean domain to the Boolean domain. Phi describes the Boolean operation that maps an n-tuple with entries from 0, 1 to 1 if the function that maps xi to ai satisfies phi. So roughly speaking, this means that the Boolean function returns the value that you obtain by replacing the variables in the formula by the respective values, 0 or 1, and then evaluating the formula. Let's have a look at an example. The formula x1 and x2 describes the binary Boolean operation, which is given by the table on the right. We see that uh, the operation returns 1 only if both arguments are 1. The formula not bracket not x1 and not x2 closing bracket describes a different Boolean operation, which is again given by a table on the right. Note that it returns the value 1 if the first argument or the second argument is 1. Since uh, this Boolean operation is a very important one, we define a shortcut for the respective propositional formula. We turn the symbol for conjunction by 180 degrees. The resulting symbol is called disjunction and pronounced OR. In Latin, you can produce it by backslash V. Besides disjunction, there are other important shortcuts that we use all the time. Let phi1 and phi2 be propositional formulas. Phi1 implies phi2, for example, is a shortcut for not phi1 or phi2. If you look at the binary Boolean operation that is described by this formula, we see that it returns 1 if whenever phi1 is true, then phi2 is true. This is the reason why this is called implication. It is written with an arrow. Some authors use a normal arrow. I use double arrow because I already use the normal arrow for functions. Then there is the shortcut phi1 double arrow phi2, which is a shortcut for phi1 implies phi2 and phi2 implies phi1. So the respective binary Boolean operation returns true if both arguments have the same value. This is why this symbol is also called equivalence. We will now define what it means that two propositional formulas are equivalent. Two propositional formulas with variables x1 up to xn are called equivalent if they describe the same Boolean operation. For example, if phi1, phi2, phi3 are arbitrary propositional formulas, then the formula phi1 and bracket phi2 and phi3 is equivalent to first bracketing phi1 and phi2 and then taking conjunction with phi3. So, so this is why we sometimes omit brackets when we write conjunctions of many propositional formulas. We have some specialized notation for conjunctions over propositional formulas that are indexed by some finite index set i. We write big wedge phi subscript small i, where small i is from our index set. This stands for the conjunction over all those formulas phi sub i. This notation is also defined if n equals zero. In this case, by definition, the expression equals true. It is very natural to define it like this. We want that all conjuncts are true. So if there is no conjunct at all, then clearly all are true. All what I observed and defined for conjunction also holds for disjunction. The empty disjunction is defined to be false, of course. 
I hope that when I die, I'm close to you, to you, to you, to you. Look at all the songs I wrote for you. I didn't buy the rules, I chose for you, for you, for you, for you. I don't know why I feel this way, this way. Everything permanent falls apart. I know how I can kill this pain, this pain. Some I tell my mom, I'm sorry, yeah. I don't have to feel this way, this way. Everything permanent falls apart. I know how I can kill this pain, this pain. Some I tell my mom, I'm sorry, yeah. I think that when I'm high, I'm over you. I think that when I'm high, over you I don't know why I feel this way this way everything permanent falls apart in the first part of the video we have seen that uh, every propositional formula describes a boolean operation in the second part of the lecture we will show that we can go back every boolean operation can be described by a propositional formula we will illustrate this with an example. Let's have a look at the following Boolean operation of area T3 given by the table on the right. We want to find a propositional formula that describes it. The operation returns one, if and only if we are in the second line or if we are in the fourth line. And this suggests that we start our formula with an or. The idea is, that the first disjunct describes the second line and that the second disjunct describes the fourth line. So let's do it. We are in the first line. If the first argument is zero, the second is zero and the third is one. So we negate x1 and x2 and we put x3 positively without negation. Then the formula not x1 and not x2 and x3 evaluates to 1 if and only if the arguments are as described in the second line. Similarly, we do that for the fourth line in the second disjunct. This time it comes out as not x1 and x2 and x3. This procedure works analogously for every Boolean operation. Note that the resulting formula has a very particular form. It is a big disjunction of conjunctions of variables or negated variables. This form is called disjunctive normal form, short DNF. It is called disjunctive because outside we started with a disjunction. Also note that we get a nice consequence. Every propositional formula is equivalent to a formula in disjunctive normal form. This follows from what we have observed so far. Dually to the DNF, there is also a conjunctive normal form, short CNF. It is a big conjunction of disjunctions of variables or negated variables. Maybe the conjunctive normal form is even more important. So we have specialized notation for it, specialized terminology. Variables or negated variables are also called literals. Sometimes pos also called positive literal if there is no negation and negative literal if there is a negation. The conjuncts in the CNF are called clauses. So a clause is a disjunction. It is simply represented as a set of literals. Every propositional formula phi is also equivalent to a propositional formula in CNF. One way to see this is to first find a DNF psi for the formula not phi. We know how to do that. We know how to find a, a DNF. Then in the next step, we rewrite not psi into conjunctive normal form using that not bracket psi 1 or psi 2 is equivalent to not psi 1 and not psi 2. And that 
not bracket psi1 and psi2 is equivalent to not psi1 or not psi2. So if we apply these rules, these equivalences, as much as we can from left to right, we end up by flipping all ors and ends and by turning positive literals into negative literals and vice versa. And the resulting formula will be in CNF. Next time, we will see an important propositional proof system. We will also discuss algorithmic aspects of finding proofs. And finally, I will present one of the most important and most difficult open research problems in all of mathematics. Close to you.